Dziękuję bardzo. Ja chciałbym teraz chwilę powiedzieć o, o tej konferencji, o tym, dlaczego tak bardzo się cieszę, że odwiedził nas Daniel Bertton. Daniel Bertton, mam nadzieję, że nie obrazi się z nami, jeżeli powiem, że jest klasykiem współczesnej analizy biograficznej. Cieszę się przede wszystkim dlatego, że prace Daniela Berto pokazują, że socjologowie nie zajmują się wyłącznie sondażami i wyborami politycznymi, ale też są w stanie skutecznie i ciekawie zajmować się życiem pojedynczych ludzi, czy pojedynczymi historiami. W tym sensie są też zdolni do przekroczenia takiego powierzchownego podziału na, na to, co konkretne i na to, co ogólne. W tym sensie prace Daniela Berto wydają mi się, mi się naprawdę ważne. Po drugie cieszę się z wizyty Daniela Berto, bo on potrafi pokazać, że analizy biograficzne nie są wyłącznie analizami narracji czy dyskursu. Że nie jesteśmy zamknięci w strukturach symbolicznych, kiedy analizujemy wywiady biograficzne, biografie pojedynczych osób, czy biografie, czy, czy historię rodzin, ale też odnosimy się, także zdobywamy jakąś wiedzę na temat świata. To może się wydawać dosyć proste, ale w we współczesnej humanistyce to jest raczej rzadko spotykane. Trzecia, trzecia rzecz, z której się niezmiernie cieszę, to jest to, że prace Daniela Berto odnoszą się do, do prac społecznych, do społecznej reprodukcji. To, to jest też tak, że często zainteresowanie biografiami, czyli indywidualnymi przypadkami, nie łączy się z analizą struktur społecznych, historii, ale jest raczej skoncentrowana na indywidualnym, niepowtarzalnym doświadczeniu albo na, na pewnych, pewnych psychicznych przeżyciach jednostki. Daniel Berto w swoich pracach świetnie pokazuje, jak indywidualne wybory, strategie łączą się z reprodukcją klas społecznych. Chciałbym teraz opowie opowiedzieć o tym, jak widzę pierwszy człon, e, pierwszy człon nazwy naszej konferencji, e, znaczy jak, e, jak kapitalizm łączy się z analizą biograficzną, czy jak, jak, dlaczego analiza biograficzna może być szczególnie przydatna do analizy dzisiejszego kapitalizmu. E, wydaje mi się, że e, Studiowanie indywidualnych przypadków, czy indywidualnych biografii nadaje się jako pewien rodzaj kontrapunktu dla analiz, które uwypuklają indywidualizację współczesnych społeczeństw. To znaczy, to jest bardzo powszechna perspektywa, że opowiada się o dynamice współczesnej rzeczywistości społecznej w perspektywie indywidualizacji. Widzi się ją jako coś, co jest w zasadzie przekraczaniem klas społecznych. To znaczy, że klasy społeczne są unieważniane przez postępy indywidualizacji. Myślę, że kiedy przykłada się socjologiczne narzędzia do analizy indywidualizacji, czy indywidualnych przypadków, to widzi się, że indywidualizacja na przykład nie znaczy tego samego w odniesieniu do, do różnych klas społecznych. Druga rzecz to, to to, że przez analizy biograficzne możemy moim zdaniem uniknąć dwóch takich niebezpiecznych skrajności. Z jednej strony takiego przekonania, że Współczesne społeczeństwa w zasadzie stwarzają nieograniczone możliwości do budowania indywidualnych projektów życiowych. Są świetnym środowiskiem dla ekspresji, konstruowania tożsamości itd. To by było mniej więcej stanowisko, stanowisko Widensa. Z drugiej strony takiego przekonania, które 
rozprzestrzenia się, czy, czy obecne jest w bardziej krytycznych perspektywach na, na dzisiejszy kapitalizm, które wypukla to, że ludzie, że w zasadzie wszystko trzyma się na włosku. Tak? Znaczy, że ludzie już ledwo wytrzymują ten kapitalizm i tak naprawdę kwestią czasu jest, kiedy on się rozleci, ponieważ ludzie nie są w stanie wytrzymać tego rodzaju obciążeń, ryzyka, niepewności. Myślę, że w tym też jest za mało analizy tego, jak wyglądają rzeczywiste, też klasowo uwarunkowane doświadczenia. A trzecia rzecz, która wydaje mi się ważna i wartościowa przy wykorzystaniu analizy biograficznej do, do, do analizy kapitalizmu współczesnego, to jest kwestia poszukiwania rzeczywistych doświadczeń, które mogą się stać źródłem nie tylko, które mogą stać się po prostu źródłem zmiany społecznej, kształtowania kapitalizmu. To znaczy tego, że kiedy dotrzemy do, do indywidualnych, ale klasowo określonych doświadczeń, doświadczeń ludzi, to dotrzemy też do pewnych zasobów, zasobów symbolicznych, zasobów materialnych, które pozwolą myśleć troszkę inaczej o zmianie społecznej. To mi się wydaje, oczywiście być może zadanie, które wykracza trochę za, za horyzont nauki, ale wydaje mi się ważne, żeby poszukiwać, poszukiwać realnych, realnych zasobów, które mogą stać się źródłem zmiany. Tylko na sobie takie że moim zdaniem świetnie się, świetnie się nadaje. I to jest w zasadzie zapowiedź tego, co będzie się działo dzisiaj wieczorem do pewnego stopnia podczas wykładu Daniela Berto, jak i jutro podczas całego dnia, na który serdecznie Państwa zapraszam od 10. Zaczniemy wykładem profesor Bertua o doświadczeniu imigrantów we Francji. Tutaj teraz z wielkim zadowoleniem mikrofon profesorowi Bertu. Ja dziękuję bardzo, profesor Gula. I'm going to speak in English, as you put it. I'm going to speak in French. But I prefer it in English. Oui, mais écoutez, tous les tous les mails ont été en anglais, donc. If I want to speak about the word capitalism, it's better that I speak in English. It's a language of the word. That's easy. Now, je, let's see. I still in English, but. I'm very happy, first of all, I'm very happy to be here in Warsaw. I, I'm familiar so, so with Warsaw from uh, for the last, uh, until two or three years ago, I was coming every year, uh, one week in June, it's wonderful, Warsaw in June, uh, to teach at the Center for Social Studies. Um, it's part of the Academy of Science, I think. And there were students from all over the Central Eastern part of Europe and Russia and Kazakhstan and Romania. And I collected, I had them do uh, get the stories of families over several generations. And so it had fascinating uh, cases of uh, families, uh, 70 years of uh, families in uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Moscow, Takamoro, or Poland, or Hungary, or Romania. Um, so, I'm, I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, now there is what I don't like, I'm a bit less happy about the formality of this uh, evening and giving a sort of formal conference, I don't like that very much. Uh, this is one of the things I share with uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who was uh, my teacher in Paris for, 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 <coughs> for years, um, and he was with it. And then, um, he also hated this uh, formal conference. I remember we organized a conference in Maison de Sciences de Rome in Paris. We thought, and he said, no, I don't want to come. In. But I, I'm interested in only talking uh, workshop. Workshop you know, with 10 persons. So we organized it as a workshop, but of course the word spread. And when he came there, was, uh, the room was packed. And he, he got up and he wanted to go out. So we brought him and we forced him to sit down again. 
<laughs> because he didn't like to do that, and I don't like either. See, we, we are no teacher. Uh, we are he and me and other people who have a research orientation. And a research orientation means always uh, trying to try to understand the world out there, out there, and uh, trying to figure out how it works, and uh, having always some doubts about what we think it is, or about our own theorization. By the way, I'm a, I was explaining to my check, I, I was trained as a scientist before moving to sociology, I mean a real scientist. Um, uh, hard science, and uh, you learn that. You, know, you learn to always have doubts about your own interpretation. Um, whereas, uh, I'm not a professor, I'm sure there are professors here, you are pro probably professors. My wife, Catherine Delcroix, being involved, is a professor. Professor is the contrary. Professor, they have to, by their position, they have to give certainty. They have to say, this is the way things are. So the children are happy. You know, da, 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 they write down. Now, of course, the next professor will say the contrary, and then, then they are lost. Uh, this happened in France uh, because we had various theoretical schools. So. But anyway, I, I don't like really to, to make a formal conference. So I will sort of talk for. Um, 30, 35 minutes, no more, please. Interrupt me. Uh, so that would have a chance to discuss a little bit. And uh, I don't have the impression that I've come here just for a set up a show in the theater and uh, not communicate with the public. That's, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow you, you, have the, you have the real virtual because tomorrow I'm going to talk about the research I've done the, on the bakery, uh, bakery research. The, the one who made me sort of uh, known uh, outside France um, because uh, combine two very, very different things. Uh, a focus on the uh, relation of production within this branch of uh, industry, which is mostly artisanal, by the way, small bakeries. One of the problem is, one of the questions is how come France still have 90% of the bread made by small bakers, whereas in the United States, Canada, Northern Europe, uh, most countries it's done in, in factories. That was one of the questions. But I was interested in the relation of production between bakers and bakery workers. Uh, and so uh, that was a kind of Marxist or Marxian orientation. At the same time, I'm combining with life stories, which is very bizarre. And this combination worked very well because I was able to understand the inner workings of this branch years, but uh, little by little, interviewing first bakery workers, then bakers, then bakers' wives, apprentices, getting into history and uh, find out the secret, the very secret of the branch. So tomorrow, that's, we'll be able to talk about the research. And that's, that's uh, it's a good talk. It's not the first time I'm going to have it, but it's, uh, it works. Now tonight, <laughs> it's more general. The topic, uh, the topic we discussed on, on email with Maciek is uh, biographical experience and varieties, varieties of capitalism. I think it's uh, because we discussed about, uh, say, the ultra liberal form of capitalism, deregulated, like the one in the United States since uh, the 80s, and this sort of the the one we have in France, uh, Germany, and Belgium. Holland and especially the Nordic countries, which is uh, which is market economy. That's how we call it, capitalism, but with uh, welfare, with some welfare, some degree of welfare, and that's it makes quite a difference, I think, for for the biography of people, um, for the biography of salaried people, because for the upper class, for the elite, I'm going to talk about the elite. It's of course doesn't make any difference. So that's that's a bit the, the topic. But first of all, I want to say. And, and uh, talking very sincerely uh, of my of my recent discovery of the Polish scholar for Maciej Dula, and the work is done on Bourdieu because you know I began reading his work and I thought ah ah this is still another scholar uh, copying distinction or the distinction and showing how well he has or he or she has read it and. Uh, 
had already several experience about this, from Germans, from Swedes, and from American scholars. Um, but this is completely different. What Magic has done is, is read very well, I think, uh, Bourdieu, but he has a knowledge of the uh, evolution of Bourdieu uh, along his career, his, 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 his kind of almost it's a political shift to the right, or to the, to the middle, let's say. Uh, interesting point is that the more in the 80s uh, and 90s, uh, the more uh, Bourdieu was coming in the public and having uh, conferences for the, for the general public and taking very radical position, he was taking radical position actually, criticizing the finance and all this. And, uh, at the same time, what he was writing was more and more sort of conservative. Like you went to the point, if we talk about classes, you went to the point and said that classes, this is a famous conference in Tokyo, uh, classes uh, don't exist by themselves, they have to be constructed. So it takes uh, the work by uh, union leaders, uh, politicians, and all this to construct the class as a class position, the class for, for itself. Otherwise, it's just an aggregate of, of persons. And I think this is totally, it is wrong. Because it's true for the for the see, working class, and it's probably true for the lower middle class. But if he takes the upper class, he doesn't take anybody to to, to, to organize it into a group uh, very aware of his own interest and uh, having a speaking the same language, having the same uh, sharing the same values, and uh, working in the same direction. Because simply the practice, the practice of exercising power in institution in enterprises uh, uh, does every day, you know, meeting a lot of people um, and discussing with them the whole day, um, going to dinners and all this. Uh, this practice uh, of being part of a pretty called society, high society, uh, being part of that, it uh, makes them into a class in itself, a class for itself, and it's the only class for itself, I, I believe, that is always ex existent, uh, strong, aware, uh, conscious, and, and uh, willing to go on fighting. Uh, they, they hate so, the expression class struggle, of course, which is, I think, is a horrible Marxism. But that's what they do every day, of course. The class, class struggle from at home never stops. You know, they, they should have a science. During globalization, the class struggle from a world goes on. This is what they are doing. Um, so um, I think I think Magic went uh, understood very well Bourdieu and went beyond uh, the analysis of Bourdieu in a distinction which obviously everybody knows here, I suppose. No? Is it translated to into Polish uh, distinction? Yes. It is. Yes. Everybody who is interested in sociology uh, should do that. It's not. Uh, but uh, what what is amazing is that uh, he was able to organize a few uh, critical studies in Poland uh, on on topic which seems to be uh, sort of marginal, like you know, riding a bike in Warsaw, or, or the relation to pets, to animals, uh, and uh, and taking quite a number of things out of it, which was uh, extremely meaningful. And I think your 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 conclusion, which is summarizing three words, which is ease, order, and familiarity. Uh, of course, this is reducing the whole, the whole thinking. But I, I don't think this is in what is it? It's, it's, well, to some extent, I really never, never, never found that as simple as that in what you know, much as you know, all of you, much you say that uh, core, core value or orientation of uh, uh, working class people and its familiarity with others, uh, familiarity to, to what they like is to be in a, in a world which with the control is familiar, yeah, with people which, with whom they have familiar relations. Uh, for the upper class is uh, ease, feeling at ease, and for the middle class, order. Uh, well, I think this is very meaningful. It's, 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 it's a bit overdone, but it's very, it's very meaningful. By the way, do you, do you know why people in the elite feel so much at ease? Let me tell you the secret. Like, uh, if 
few, a few years ago, I met, uh, I have in my family, my remote family, etc., a branch of uh, people who are part of the elite. Uh, you, the men travel around the world, and, uh, and okay, but the women are in Paris, and there are some uh, my aunts, my cousins, you know, but we, don't, we never see each other because we're, we belong to different worlds, actually. But one day there was a funeral of one of my uncles, and so I went to the funeral, and so after the, after the ceremony in the church, we went out, and so we saluted everybody, and, and these uh, three women, uh, which was my aunt, my, my cousin, and my, my second remote cousin, they, they were talking with me, oh, a long time we have not seen you, how are you? Uh, I said, I'm all right, <laughs> but I'm, I'm maybe tired. Oh. I, are you a uh, health problem? No, 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 I don't have health problem. But, but I um, have too much work, I work too much. They look at me. Oh, oh you work. Oh, that's right, you work. Yeah. But then it's a big surprise to meet somebody uh, who was working and who was not on top of his work. You know, I just is a, um, they don't have to work. So if you didn't have to work, you would feel much more at ease, you know? <laughs> so yes, we, we have to remember that because we tend, see, this is normal, we tend to project over other media what we take for granted in our way of life. But let's face it, we are not part of the elite, not part of the upper class. And so we, we should, as any anthropologist, we should, we should be aware of the ethnocentrism of the class, the danger of being a class ethnocentric, and projecting on them but really, they are really different people, like uh, Scott Fitzgerald, who was, you know, the famous conversation between Scott Fitzgerald, who was writing on the rich, and Hemingway. Scott Fitzgerald was fascinated by the rich. And Hemingway was saying, what, what are you fascinated, what are you so fascinated about the rich? Oh, they are, they are so different. And Hemingway said, yeah, they're different, they're, they're, they are money. But that's, it has so much money that the, it's not a quantitative difference, it's a qualitative one. And that's, that's, a, that's a crucial point that you make, is that would you, would you count money? Because if you know the classification of would you, uh, you had the, the, the ruling class, the middle class, and the class populaire, working classes, and he was putting the high school teachers in the ruling class. Yeah, because in a very statistical category, you couldn't split the category between upper cadre and middle cadre. And, uh, but high school teachers in the upper class don't make of course, in any sense. Um, now, um, so I'm, I'm very, I think, I think uh, magic has done a, a, a move forward, the, the vision of Bourdieu. And uh, we'll discuss later on uh, how we can uh, import some of your uh, writings in, in France and give it to, it to, the, to, the, to the public in, in France. Let's see, it's important that they, they don't stay on board you, but they, they, move, they move on forward. Um, now, the, the thing, uh, I have many things to talk about. It's difficult to choose uh, the topic, like uh, I remember Avid Gunner telling me that the problem of the intellectual is to transform resources into topic. You know, that, that's a problem I have to make. I need topic, I have many, many, many resources. But one thing comes to my mind to begin with. Um, where is the word going? And it's important for us to know because uh, because the world is changing faster and faster and faster. And so we might be surprised by the big change which might happen. In, uh, I'm, I'll give you some figures in, in, a, in a minute. Um, but uh, I've discovered recently that uh, around the year 2000, people like Zygmunt Bauman, Ulrich Beck, John Murray, which is a British sociologist, they all converge on the same one single idea, which is uh, the world has become fluid. There is no borders anymore. There is no, almost no states, you know, flows. People circulate. Capital circulates, uh, images circulate, uh, meaning circulate around the world, you know, television, media, and all this. 
So the world has become, uh, I want to put it, liquid modernity. No one considers this as a poor, as living in Britain, a citizen of, of the world. Uh, liquid modernity. It's, it's quite strange because uh, in France we have, we still have, uh, we are extremists of the state. We are very statist. The, the state is, the state and social security capture more than 50% of the gross national product. Very distributed, but they, they capture that. We are sort of, we're champion in, in this. Uh, even uh, in front of Sweden, which is not a very stable. So, I mean, this idea of a liquid modernity for us, because the state is the contrary. The state is hierarchical, the, the state is a, uh, is, woman talks about the state gardener. How, how is it in Polish? I don't know, but he has this image. Ogromi. Huh? Ogromi. Ogromi. Exactly, but there's the state Ogromi, which is a, for him, this is all conception of the state. And, and the new conception for him is a state as a gamekeeper. You have the chass. You know, what is that? Uh, I don't know. Just make sure that there is enough game. Uh, Strange. Uh, you see what I mean? The state which is almost absent. Uh, the wildlife takes place by itself, you know, no intervention. Now, uh, Ulrich Beck has a number of, the same, you know, 10 years ago, 10, 14 years ago, he has the same um, kind of ideas. Uh, he says, uh, we, we are building a, a, a picture of a new imaginative social science and let's say a cosmopolitan social science. That's what he says. He says, we, we must get rid of the <coughs> methodological nationalism. Bourdieu thinks about, when, he, when Bourdieu talks about society, he talks about French society. <laughs> when persons talk about societies, this is American society. Uh, German uh, socialists, we talk about German society. They never say it. They think their own society as a sort of model of the rest of the world, which is, of course, more and more uh, unthinkable. But, uh, so Ulrich Beck points actually to this. But then, then it goes much further. He says, there is no such thing as society anymore. And then Touraine, uh, the president says the same. Uh, there is no society anymore. I mean, it's, it's all flows. It's all moving. You know, the way, there is no French capital. It's a picture of international capital. There is no, uh, anyway, there is no French literature anymore. There is uh, world literature. I don't know. This kind of world music. This kind of music. Everything becomes world. That's, that's cause, uh, very far. Uh, my own wife and other people, they are focused on immigration, and what they see is exactly the contrary. They see the borders. They see the borders in uh, uh, Frontex, which is a, an organization which prevents Africans to move to south of uh, Italy, Lampedusa, where there are dramas. Yeah? If important you are following the, the leadings of the Pope, and you know the Pope went to Lampedusa. In, in uh, when was that? In uh, March, I think, uh, last year, and say, how oh, this is a shame for mankind, what's happening in Lampedusa. And two, two months later, there's a huge, uh, you know, blockage, shipwreck, uh, with a lot of uh, corpses. Uh, so we, we see the borders. So some people, we had a long discussion in my center uh, between the two views of the world. Is it, is it circulation or is it borders? By more and more borders. A guy who works uh, in uh, close to the United Nations said that there was a, there is no 193 uh, nation on the world. Where uh, in after the war, after let's say in the 50s, there were only 60. So more borders, many more borders, with independence of uh, uh, first the French colonies, British colonies, and with the independence of uh, some uh, countries in the Union. You have more and more and more and more borders. Yes? Uh, so this is not circulation, this is borders. I think, and I think to me uh, to consider these two views. I think there is, uh, they have a point, the, the liquid modernity things, they have a point, it's not only there are, of course, no mobility of capital, mobility of, of ideas, of uh, bits and pieces of meaning and images and all this, 
but uh, there is, but people don't move that fast. But there is, there might be growing motility. Motility is a, a concept I borrowed from biology. Biology, motility means uh, the, the natural capacity of living organisms to move. Right? To move, to move first of all, to move uh, their, their, their members, their body, but also to move them. Motility. So it might be that uh, if we adapt the, the concept, it might be increasing motility or motivation to move, motivation to go away, motivation to leave. There's uh, a lot of uh, countries in the south, in Africa, uh, especially in Asia, which are in great trouble, so they want to leave. They want to go elsewhere. So you have a growing motivity. But we don't see how fast it is growing because we prevent them weak the north. We prevent them to move as much as they would like to, to move, you see. So there are very few countries who are still open to uh, free immigration. Uh, Australia is one. Australia has 20 million inhabitants, but they want to go to up to 38 million. So they, they are very uh, open. But this is a one and rare country. So increasing mobility, motility, but increasing number of borders and toughening hardening of borders. That makes sense. So, I seem to be far from my topic, I am not at all, because of course for biographical uh, matters, uh, for uh, what is, uh, if, you, if you are an African uh, who is trying to, who has a, with the help of your whole village, uh, they, 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 they give you a little bit of money, each of them, so that you can pay for the passer of the people who are always across the borders, and you arrive and you are stuck in Morocco, you can go further, but, but you cannot go back. It's impossible to go back, because these people have put all their hopes on you. Who, you, the, the one person who wants to get into the rich world and send back money and remittances. So, this, this, is, this is, what is at stake is uh, even is our future, the future of the whole village, and it's your life, because if you try to cross anyway, you may, you may end up uh, dying, as you know. There is an atlas in France done by Olivier Clochard of the deaths around, the, around Europe, you know, the number of deaths which is growing every year in Canaria, in the Mediterranean, it's, it's, a, it's a frightening. So, there is this thing, I'm, I'm very reluctant to, uh, to agree with Bauman and Ulrich Beck and all this. I think that the state is very important. And that brings me to my second point. My second point is the following. Uh, we, indeed, we are in a, in a world of uh, swift global, globalization, and, and globalization means uh, market economy, uh, uh, that's how we call capitalism, but let's call it market economy. However, and, and I think we have the same market economy roughly in France, in Western Europe, in North America, and probably now coming to Poland and, and uh, Central Eastern Europe. Yes, it's a market economy. And I've been uh, recently in Japan, spending uh, six weeks in Japan, and uh, it's quite interesting. They also have market economy, but they have buffers. Uh, they have uh, ways to protect people from the, from the toughness of market economy in Japan. And this is the same for a number of European countries, clearly. Uh, this is the case in France, in Germany, in Belgium. And of course, in Nordic countries, very importantly. Now, uh, these buffers, this protection, need uh, either self local self management, but this doesn't happen, or a state, a strong state, which organizes. You know, the state has gardener, if you want to go back. And so the state has gardener is not only an old figure of the past, a kind of a zombie concept. No, it is uh, in terms of class and uh, it is uh, protection, it is important. I'll give you some figures. Um, how much time I have uh, now? Just, uh, I think it's uh, half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take half an hour. But there is this, uh, recently I found uh, this guy, uh, Dorling, uh, from Oxford University. Um, he wrote a paper. It was published in English, but in a, in a Portuguese journal. But he's, he, the guy was saying he has a scoop. He has a scoop. He has a, a device designing new index of inequality. 
Inequality, of course, is, is a concept I don't like very much because uh, uh, inequalities um, points to the end result of some of some processes which are ignored, which remain uh, un unknown and uncertain, and which this process are of course a class a class relation. But so we produce inequality it seems to fall from the sky. It doesn't, of course. But inequality has become a sort of a way, a, a, a polite way to talk about class. Um, then uh, growing inequality, we know that the word over. Doling has a, a new index of inequality, which is the ratio between the 1%, the income of the top 1%, and, and, and the income of the, the median income in the human society. Yes? So you see this ratio. This ratio in 12 Western countries measured from the 20s to the present time. And the result, going very fast, is that in the 20s, the ratio was very high. It's like 15, 15 to 1. So the, the, the rich 1% got an income. We're just talking about income. We're not talking about uh, poverty. Uh, the income is 15 times the median income. Then there was a big depression and it began falling because the rich become less richer. And although the poor got poorer, but the rich got very fast. The loss of then there was a war. Then there was a, after, it fell to about seven to one. Practically in all Western countries. This is interesting because you know it's, it's a very parallel curve. Seven to one. And after the war, during what we call in France, the Trente Glorieuse, the Glorious. Uh, 30 years between 1945 and 1975, let's say, um, there, there was, it stayed about that, like that, at seven, the rate of seven to one in, in France, in Britain. In, in Britain was labor, labor government for a long time. Um, in Germany, which was the constructing set, in the United States, in Canada, one to seven. And then at the end of the 70s, it starts growing. When it grows, quite differently. In the United States and in Britain it goes very fast and it's now up to 15 to 1. That is uh, the same rate we had in the 1920s. And perhaps if you if you read the American press, I do read the American press every day, uh, they now it's well known. Paul Krugman has been saying that for a long time, for it's such an overpriced, that uh, the, the average uh, American household has an income which is has been falling out since 1999. So that's for, 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 for a long time, for 15 years, it's been falling. Uh, and, and, and even before it was not that high. It's just, uh, there is a lot of money in the state, but it concentrates at, at the top. Now, the scoop of uh, Dolin, Daniel Dolin, the scoop is the following, it is, it is not everywhere the same. The ratio is not 15 to, to 1 in all countries. Look at the Germany, it's, uh, it's, a, it's growing, but it's much slower. Uh, in uh, Belgium, in Sweden, and even in France, that's country nobody knows about because there's people write only in French, which is now like Hungarian, nobody reads French. But you know, it's, they, it's 91, it's not 15 to 1. So there is a difference. And he says, I don't understand the difference because uh, it's the same market economy. Or perhaps, perhaps the difference, uh, politics. Politics would be the difference. Now, uh, indeed, if you look at the time when, when it started growing up again, it was 19, at the end of the 70s, I think. That's when Thatcher came to power in Britain. That's when Reagan came uh, in uh, power in the uh, United States. At the same time, we had not really left this government in France, Germany, continental Europe, which government which were more moderate, shifting from left to right and rather center. So, so this is the good news. Politics work. This is news. So now for people who have been analyzing capitalism, the thing, you know, politics are now, you know, marginalized, uh, and people don't believe it, which is rather true. But politics work. That's the good news. The bad news is that they work both ways. If you have sort of Modern left governments they keep protecting the people if, if they are uh, uh, right, like this, like Thatcher uh, or Cameroon, they let it go and zoom. Uh, and go so, so politics do work, still do work, but 
uh, in both ways. I'll give you some, some figures. Uh, recently, we have issued a book about uh, poverty and precarity uh, with uh, Catherine and a uh, colleague, Pepper. Uh, if you have the market economy of uh, UN free, it produces about 25% of relative poverty. Relative poverty being defined, as you know, as a, uh, the uh, household who have an income which is less than half the median income. That's how that's how it's officially measured in the European Union or elsewhere. So sometimes it's 60 percent, 50 percent. If you are below 50 percent of the median income, you are you are supposed to be poor. Okay. Now, market economy left to itself will produce 25 percent of of relative poverty, it could not produce more actually, or hardly produce more because the, the way the index is constructed, you can have 50 percent, you, you can have 50 percent below, of course, because you have 50 percent below the median income and you want to go below half of the median income, so that's 25. In Guatemala, I've checked, Guatemala is an extremely unequal country, there's only 28 percent poor, so it shows that uh, Settings, the maximum is 25. That's where, that's almost where the United States are now. You know, it's a, uh, it's uh, what are the figures? Uh, they are 16% uh, poor, but 20% of American children, and even more of uh, aging Americans are below the line of poverty. Now, in France, another figure for France. If you, if you, if we had no welfare state, you would be the same. It would be about the same, 50%, or 60%, 80%, 20%, and more for the children because single mothers are among the, the, the biggest, the largest category of the poor. Now, uh, because we have the welfare state uh, in France, we don't have uh, 25 or 20% of the poor, but 8%, which is a huge difference, huge difference. It's a millions of families which are set up. Uh, moved above the, the poverty line. And I don't know what is the welfare system for Poland, but uh, I've been talking process in England about this, and the people, people mistake the welfare state uh, for a uh, assistance system, system assisting the poor, which is typically the liberal conception. But that's not that at all. Uh, we're talking about insurance welfare. So public insurance, we have, we have a public system of uh, solidarity for health care, for pensions, for unemployment, for uh, industrial accidents, and also for uh, a number of children. That means and every time somebody gets paid, part of the money is, is withdrawn from his uh, paycheck or her paycheck to go to these five big public funds, which pay for the pension, which pay for the, um, for the health care, which pay for the allocation uh, familiar. So it means that in France, it's not the rich who pay for the poor. It's mean it's, there are people who are healthy who pay for the ill. There are people who are still active who pay for the old, pay for the pension of the old. There are uh, people who have no children or, or only one child, they pay for people who have several children. People who, are, uh, who have a job pay for the unemployment. You see, it's this horizontal solidarity. And this is very important uh, to me to transform the biographical perspective of people. If you live in, a, in such a system, you can have a sort of uh, vision. Uh, you feel more secure, let's say. You are not always on the market. Like in the United States, I've been living in the United States. Did they tell you you are on the market? The whole, whole life you are on the, on the market. That's how it, they put it. Now, in French, we have some, something extra, which is a bit bizarre, I must admit. Um, this is a dream of many youths to become a civil servant. I don't think they have that in Poland. I'm sure they don't have that in the United States, because civil servant for them is uh, nothing. Uh, it means a mediocre people. Uh, we do get a mediocre income <laughs> and do. Uh, meaningless, uh, have a meaningful job. But in France, we have this uh, focus. This, it's almost an obsession on, uh, on, on civil service. It goes, of course, with uh, 
with the respect of the states uh, that we all have. Um, Personally, in France, all teachers from the Maternel Catholic University, which is uh, all free, the whole system is free, uh, they are all uh, civil servants, that's, uh, that's one million people. Um, I don't know, you have Maternel here, the kindergarten, the, the three, uh, three years before, between age three and six. You have that, yeah. And uh, it's very useful because that's how the sons and daughters of immigrants learn their language. And when they come to the primary school at six, they already speak the language. We, com we compare Israel, I believe Israel now. Compared with Germany, they don't have the system. Mm. Although they invented the word kindergarten, but they don't have, they don't have many of them. And, and so the, the, the sons and daughters of Turkish family, they come to the primary school the first year, they were, they were in German, and they're completely lost. And so they, they, they cannot they, they, they have a big lag. So they fail their studies much more often than in France. And then they, then they go into apprenticeship and then they get a job rather easily. In France it's different. They, they, they sons and children of immigrant family, they speak French, they can, they can do rather well at school. Some of them don't, but some of them do very well, especially the daughters, because the daughters are kept at home and uh, they are not allowed to go in the streets, so they kept at home and they work and they, they, they succeed quite well school, even better than a French girl from the same uh, class already. Uh, but after that, we have discrimination on, on the labor market. That's, that's a big problem here in France. It's a different problem. You see what I mean? And I mean, if I go back to the geographical experience, if you are in the civil service, it's, 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 not, it's prestigious in France, not because of the salary, not because of the wages, but because I would say they Security, that's what people say, security, the security. Uh, what it means is that you know you are going to keep your job for life. Maybe your job will disappear, but they will find you another job to do, something else to do. For life means not only until you retire, but after retirement. Uh, I was trying to explain that to, 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 to foreigners. If you not understand, so I say, okay, imagine, imagine a long roast beef. Every month, they cut the slice for you, you see. They cut the slice for you, which is a salary. And, and the, you know the roast beef will last until, until you die, actually. And even after the death, your widow will have half of the slice. Uh, if, and if you have been married several times, your know, three widows are going to share the slice. The rest of the but anyway, it gives you a temporal, it, it, you know, it's a horizon, how do you say that? The horizon gets gets in the background much further. If you are not in the market anymore, you know, worried about what may happen tomorrow, but it gives you safety. So it has a lot of uh, interesting consequences. One of them, for instance, is uh, you can borrow money to buy a house and to escape the, the housing market. You can go to the bank, and the bank will loan you money because you are a secret servant, so they know they are going to get, you are going to get the salary every year for 20 years, so they, they can give you a loan for 20 years. Whereas if you if you make much more money, but in a private enterprise, oh, they're going to discuss uh, about uh, to check. You know, if I know people who are uh, owners of restaurants, for instance, uh, um, making good money, but they cannot get uh, loans for buying a house. I mean, it's more difficult for them because there's, there's this time dimension, which, uh, which of course they don't have. So, I'm not uh, giving a civil service as a model, but the point is, I want to say this, um, there is a danger. There is a danger that uh, uh, if, we, if too many people are convinced by the discourse of uh, liquid modernity, and uh, let's, let's have a free market, and let's, uh, let's everybody free to take initiative. Uh, and I know that probably more people, young people, young generation, that's what they want. That's what they want. Have to show their own abilities. Uh, it's a very strong discourse. But um, in fact, it may, may lead to catastrophe. Let me give you just one more figure and then I'll stop. Um, I, I'm not reading the word trade journal every day, I should actually, uh, because that's, that's where you understand how the word uh, works. But I, I went, uh, happened to find a copy of Time magazine the other day. Um, there is a column, columnist, a woman called 
for the Baron Polomar, who was writing a column for the curious capitalist. And she was writing about inequality. And she said, inequality, this is an issue of February 10th. Inequality is not just a social issue, it's putting the future of the world economy in peril. She writes. Well, of course, if it were just a social issue, they wouldn't give a damn about it. But it's putting the future of the world economy and for our business in peril. Ah, so it deserves attention. Inequality is bad and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Not just in the US, but in the rest of the world, thanks to forces of globalization and technology. Now, globalization of technology, we have seen before with the example of uh, Doring, the study of Doring, that showed that globalization is the same everywhere, technology is the same everywhere, but it has different consequences, whether they're because of politics in one country or another. That, that's one of the points I wanted to make. But of course, she is unaware of that, or she doesn't want to know about it. So, what's happening? Uh, what's going to happen? <coughs> Uh, she was in Davos, you know, Davos Forum. She, they were talking about that this year. Inequality is bad for business, so she will do something. What should we do about it? Um, she says, well, globalization and technology that tend to wipe out middle income jobs. That's, that's our jobs. Middle income jobs. That she's talking about us. <coughs> but us, I mean, as a class, not me, I'm just retired, but, but middle income jobs and favor those at the very top of the socio-economic ladder. And listen to this. A new McKinsey Global Institute study found that 230 million white-collar jobs, representing $9 trillion in income, will be transformed or even eliminated. Transform means downgraded, that's what it means. <laughs> or even eliminated by computers in the next decade. Next decade is almost tomorrow. You know. This is why inequality was one of the hot topics of discussion at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where Eric Schmidt, the former chief executive officer of Google, warned, he said, we are in a race between computers and people, and we need to make sure the people win. We are in a race between computers and people, and we are to make sure the people win. Do you trust the chief executive of Google to have uh, people win over computers? I don't. Frankly, I don't. Um, so this is a situation. <laughs> uh, yes, reminds me of a cartoon in the New Yorker, like a long time ago, 40, 40 more, 40 plus years ago, when they, well, when I began working as a scientist in intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, we had the huge computers, you know, the, you know like big like this. And then they discovered the transistor. So they started miniaturizing the computers. Uh, that was the beginning. And I remember a cartoon in the New Yorker. You see, it's, it's Wall Street, and you two guys in the streets a bit sad. And one of them tells the other, what, what was really specially hurt, they be just laid off. You know, they lost their job. And the guy said, what, what did hurt? especially it was to be replaced by the single transistor. But uh, that's perhaps what uh, was going to happen. Now, Mrs. Rana, curious capitalist for her, asked Eric Schmidt uh, whether he had a solution for these 230 million uh, white collar jobs. And he said, well, to turn workers into entrepreneurs, we will avoid a nine to five job for portfolio career, portfolio career means to play on the stock exchange and to use technology to vastly increase their productivity and eventually their wealth. But she was not coming, she says, and only a slim fraction of the population is cut out to be entrepreneurs. Now, entrepreneur is something else. Entrepreneur is not a portfolio thing. Entrepreneur, uh, you can, I've just spoken with an Australian on a plane. It's amazing in Australia. Everybody's creating his own enterprise doing fast. But what's interesting is that Eric Schmidt has no idea other than the stock exchange. And that's, is it, there is a deep truth there. It used to be so that uh, people who were defending capitalists, say, like uh, Hayek, for instance, would say everybody get a chance, free enterprise, to start his own business, 
and, and make it grow because uh, they, they work hard, they are intelligent, they are aware of the opportunities and all this. This discourse is dying. This discourse is dying. Why? Because, because big companies are, are, are taking over all the markets, you know, and then so we, you want to start a restaurant, but you have a McDonald's, which just gets just a small example. So, so this is a, so we are, we are, we are in a world uh, which is becoming tough. And it's important to say it because, uh, because uh, otherwise we forget about it. We have this, this image coming from the United States that the world is fluid, it's a market. What is a market? Market is completely horizontal. You walk in the market, you, you do your own shopping, nobody forces you, it's perfectly free. Uh, I mean, not free of charge, but you are free to buy or not to buy. It's a flat world. The world is flat. It's Thomas Friedman, an editorialist of the New York Times. This is not true. The world is not flat. The world is hierarchical and there are borders and all this. And, and you have a concentration at the top. And there's a lot of, uh, of power there. But it's rather difficult to, um, to pin down uh, what is power. Uh, what is the power, the new power that is given by the uh, property. I've been reading a lot of literature. There are some people who say, um, like my Castells, that uh, the this financial flow are made by computers now. There is nobody behind. This to me is, is I don't know, he lives in the United States. Uh, how can he write something like this? is uh, to be uh, uh, irrelevant. But th there are groups uh, of, of, of people and I think sociology should concentrate more on them. I've been trying to, to tell that to my French colleague for a long time. Um, I'm happy uh, much a uh, little bit work on the subject. Uh, because uh, from what these people have in mind, it's uh, probably depends uh, partly the fate of the world. Even if we have this interesting phenomena that much mentioned, that uh, the hegemony <laughs> Is more the hegemony of ideas is more middle class. These people don't influence very much the ideas, apparently, but they don't have to anymore. Um, There's one thing I discovered when we uh, finish on this. One thing I discovered in the '77 when I did a study of the French oligarchy. Uh, I took the wood book and I looked at the families of the very rich people and I recomposed the family. You know, and I was amazed to discover that a lot of people who have different names uh, actually belong to the same family, the same capital. So. Uh, and, uh, and then as soon as I discovered that they were precious people who were from, coming from the high bronze école, the Polytechnique in France, the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, the top school, and who married sisters, sisters for instance of the De Verdel family, the big steel uh, barons. Uh, so the guy marries his daughters to this brilliant young man. And that's why when you when you go through the pages of the Wood Wood, you see that this guy, which you've heard about it because they were minister of uh, De Gaulle, for instance. We, you know they are industrialists, you know they are very rich entrepreneurs. Uh, but they became rich because they married the daughters of a big fortune, a steel fortune. Now, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. sort of one thing there. Uh, the hypothesis is the following. Suppose you are, suppose you are a very rich, rich person, uh, but uh, you have been making a fortune or, or perhaps uh, inheriting a big fortune but making it big and making it international, investing in, in, in good places in China, you name it. Uh, and you have sons and you have daughters. And you want, of course, uh, the, the, the company to go on. It's not a company, it's a network of various companies. You want that to go on and to grow and to grow and to grow. Now, unfortunately, your sons are not very bright. And they don't work very hard. They, they had it too easy, you know. They never had to work, you know, to, to begin with. Um, so perhaps some of them, the work will come their way, like my chick has been writing. They say people in the elite, they don't look for a job. The job comes to them, naturally. But uh, if you are the father of these sons and daughters, it's so much easier to marry your daughter with a bright young man 
coming from one of these top schools. We're just dying to buy your daughter, you see. And just uh, the queuing in line to buy your daughter. You, you pick up the best. And I hope they make a good uh, love uh, couple, but love is some professor. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's why after one, two generations, you realize that uh, there are so many men with different names which belong to the family because they married a sister. You can say it, it's just hypothesis that you can check by, by uh, leaving to the pages of Wibu. So, uh, in France, we have this partic particular idea, which is probably not the case in the United States, is that, uh, this, that the same person who was a big entrepreneur and come from the ground before and started carrying the states. So we have a kind of fusion between the state and, and a big, a big enterprise. And at the same time, we, we need the state for protecting the, the weakest, let's say, in the competition. So that, that's, a, that's a dilemma, constant dilemma in the French situation. But in the United States, you have nothing of that. Or, uh, nothing of that. In the United States, the discourse in the United States is the following. And that's how it ended up on this. The discourse is uh, the state the state's a bother. We don't want to, we don't want, we want to deregulate the whole world. We want to, not to have, the state means um, regulation, you know, regulation about uh, hiring and firing. You cannot hire people like this. You can find people like this. You, you have environmental uh, laws, regulation. So you cannot invest properly because, you know, there's always some law in France, for instance, or in Sweden, prevents you to do what you want to do because, because of some, because you are going to destroy a, a little flower will happen to grow it right there, or whatever. You know, this is. We don't want to do that. Get rid of that. We, we want to, uh, to be to be free to do what, what we want to do. So we have no states. The state is a burden. This is this is really the mentality of the ultra-liberal people. Now, if you ask them, okay, you don't want to you want to suppress the states? Yes. What about the American state? No. No, 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 we need that. It's important for democracy, it's important that... Uh, <laughs> uh, but you see, Americans don't have an ID. Uh, the, the American state, you have to see it from, from outside. And you see that it's enormous defense uh, expenses. Uh, um, presence on five continents. It's amazing the num number of us, you know, people, uh, Americans who are, who are actually serving for a number of years in the, in the Air Force, in the Army, in, in various places around the world. Um, but um, if you are within America, you don't see the states. You just see a police station, a police uh, car from time to time. They have the impression they, they, the state is not interfering with their own life. So it's uh, very important to remember that point. Uh, I remember discussing with Castells, precisely, a long time ago, in Wallerstein, in Paris, and Touraine. And uh, and uh, Castells was proud to say that uh, in liberalism, the state is minimal. The, the, famous, uh, the state is a night watcher. Night watcher is here, we can't And uh, to very agree with that. And Wallerstein said, but that's not watching. Sorry. <laughs> Look at the British state. You, you talk about Britain. Britain, okay, is a very. It's, very liberal country, uh, 19th century, they invented liberalism, so no state. But the Navy was ruling the whole world, was ruling the five continents, the five oceans. The Navy, uh, what is the Navy? It's not the British state, the form of the British state. So that's always important to keep in mind. Okay, now I've been, um, I tell you, it was not a formal uh, talk, uh, I had a number of ideas. I don't know if it uh, works in two of the current picture or not, but, but, but who okay. cares? Let's have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, 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 now I would like to uh, ask, uh, ask the public uh, to ask yes. questions. Yes. Uh, and this is very, uh, we have many opportunities we can uh, ask uh, questions in English. Uh, po polsku. Możemy też zadawać pytania po francusku. 
Proszę bardzo. Ja będę nosił mikrofon i podawał. Paweł Załowski. Thank you very much. Uh, you ask about data about um, Polish welfare state and accidentally I know some data about this. And as a percentage of the GDP, uh, since 1989, that is the fall of communists in Poland, the spendings on, the, uh, on such uh, issues as uh, unemployment, family and health fell almost three times. And there is only one indicator that uh, grow over two times. This is the spending on the uh, uh, support for uh, uh, old people. Uh, so the, the, this is the structure of, of the uh, Polish welfare state uh, today. And it, from my perspective, this is the uh, kind of the uh, a tribute that uh, we had to pay to the post-communist uh, system. These people are now uh, on their uh, retirement. So this is why we, we have to pay for them so much. Uh, and uh, there is uh, one important reason uh, uh, that you didn't mention, the basis of the uh, welfare state. Uh, and in case of Poland, there is a huge difference compared to the uh, France, for example, that is the tax system. Uh, in the uh, developed welfare state, the tax system is progressive. In Poland, we have a flat tax system, uh, so our welfare state is uh, collapsing uh, systematically. Uh, especially the, uh, uh, the corporate tax system that were never uh, progressive in Poland. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this is one thing, and uh, one uh, another. I'm a specialist in in research on the uh, third sector uh, organizations, and I must say that this is no uh, uh, surprising that we are meeting here in the uh, associations of not at the state university in Poland. I think that this situation could not happen in, uh, uh, in France because this is also the effect of the uh, neoliberal policies. When we have cuts to the government spending, uh, there are uh, uh, more developed uh, 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 third sector organizations. Uh, in such a country as Poland, uh, financed mostly from the uh, foreign uh, sources. Uh, so, so, the, and uh, from the pers uh, and from the bio biographical perspective, I think this is very interesting issue when a uh, non-governmental organization takes over as a substitute of the uh, uh, social services from the state institution because uh, it uh, separates the uh, final uh, uh, customer. Uh, from the uh, decision maker and uh, it uh, segregates the customers uh, what is uh, in the uh, slang uh, uh, named as the targeting. Uh, so there is no universal services in this situation as in the uh, welfare state but segregated services for specific groups or especially for specific class, classes. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll uh, take more uh, comments uh, or uh, questions, and then we will uh, speak to you. Piotr I'd like to raise one question, <coughs> just raise it to system of values in the society. Uh, if we bring an example of the United States, especially in the end of 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when America uh, was under construction and after the Second World War when this uh, global, uh, global United States came into being, we see that there was a balance between very aggressive capitalistic system was uh, coming into being in America, like we say, 
you can name a few persons like Andrew Carnegie, was probably the richest man in the world. And, uh, we have, uh, who actually got his money on monopolizing the steel industry. We have uh, Rockefeller who monopolized the oil industry and uh, many others um, who basically made their money on, on monopolizing the industries. But on the other hand, there was a Protestant system of values. We, uh, we see that America was uh, well, created a certain balance between the, so, such a aggressive system and the uh, Christian system of values. And we can give you an example. Uh, there was a rule that you can go to heaven, you can get, get rich, but you go to heaven if you, at the end of your life, return at least part of your wealth to society. So you can see that we have the Carnegie Hall or uh, well, the universities and so forth, so they wanted to pay back this to the society because of this system of values. Well, what, what we see in America after the Second World War, of course there was a change because the British Empire fell into pieces and America uh, took the helm of the world because, of course, the reason was that they found out a new system power. It was it's definitely a global system of power, which is the really much more advanced than the very primitive system of running the world by the British Empire. And in fact, this is the real system of power, and that's why the America rules, and rules the world. That's why the owners of the corporations uh, owning the growing number of industries, countries, and so forth, they have to grow and the differences have to grow. That's no doubt about it. But I think uh, in the meantime, America lost its values. What we are left is the just pure aggressive capitalism. Of course, it's backed up by the, uh, the biggest army, the American army. It's probably, if you compare France, France is probably much less globalized now. It's simply not that powerful. Mm, that's why my, my question is about this part between the, the system of, well, Europe was Christian, Christianity, because there may be a system of the kind of rules. And when we are now, when Israel is gone, Maybe one more question. Yes. Thanks. I have a very short question. Uh, as you were saying that you know, kind of certain type of work, of working conditions, can be a formative experience for some type of biographies. And what, what I was, I thought was lacking in your talk was some concept of subjectivity, of political subjectivity. And I was wondering if um, biographical experience be somehow linked to the notion of precarity and precarious workers, and how have they organize themselves, especially in the context of this neoliberal or liquid modernity as you Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, give a chance to have a better answer or comment, uh, and then we'll go back to questions. Well, the, the when God was talking, I was thinking about the uh, Ah, I understood something. Bill Gates, now Bill Gates is made such a point with his micro, so about 26 billion and all. Now he's uh, very busy in his Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I uh, couldn't make sense of that. Because I think he got his money because he had tough politics also, got a kind of monopoly or, uh, you know, software, uh, web process or whatever. But, um, but you provide the well, one explanation. Uh, he wants to get uh, access to heaven, uh, the Protestant ethic. Uh, yeah, perhaps. Um, but I'll tell you something. Uh, they, you have a big get of other people who are uh, doing this philanthropy thing. 
it's an American tradition, uh, perhaps it's connected to the Protestant ethic. But uh, uh, recently, a, a weekly magazine in France, uh, Express, um, interviewed 30, or ask the same question, 30 richest uh, industrialists in France, you know, entrepreneur, all famous people. And they asked them, are you ready to do the same as uh, Mr. Gates is doing, um, you know, giving part of your money uh, for uh, public, uh, whatever, charities or innovation or the use or whatever, this and that, you know, or fighting some rare disease or this kind of thing. Are you ready to do that? No one of them was ready to do it. They said, no. So, what is the explanation? Even the party. Huh? Even the party. Well, the party is so easy. It's not so that rich. I mean, he's, he's a, you know, the party can, can tell you he, he had won his money all by himself. And mm -hmm. His salary worked for him, so it's a, it's a different party. Uh, what is the solution? Uh, I tell you a, a, true, a true anecdote. When I was uh, vice president of the International Sociological Association, um, there was our president was Tiki woman, Indian man, man from India, so sorry. And, uh, and 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 uh, and the, the association was going bankrupt, sort of, with risk of going. So woman came. There was one meeting uh, somewhere in Europe, and we had twenty people around the table from the various countries all over the world. And he said, well, I had a, I had an idea, I had a vision, but if if every uh, national association of sociologists would give say one year of one year uh, of their income to the international association the international association would be saved so please try to convince your people when you go back home and next year let's hope we have a lot of money so the next year when we met in another place uh, so he said so what are the this the, the Swedish guys said uh, well, I've, I've talked with my colleagues, and uh, okay, uh, we think it's necessary to have this uh, ISA, so we are going to provide it. Ah, uh, the Norwegian say, the, the, the Danish say the same. Uh, but the German said, uh, we have uh, been uh, discussing hard because you think uh, that the poor management so are a bit angry, but uh, nevertheless, we see the necessity, it's our duty, so we will do it. Um, as for the French, I was waiting for the other people to talk because I was not sure the French would do it, but I had been founding the, the French association, so I had some labor on it. Uh, but the Italian, uh, he turned to the Italian, Paolo Massad. I asked him, so what about Paolo? What about the Italian association? Well, you say, the Italian, my colleague, my Italian colleague, I told them exactly that we need, and we need, it's our duty to finance the ISA and that uh, uh, other people from other countries, uh, we may do it, so we have to do it too. But unfortunately, uh, you know, in Italy, uh, we don't have a day Protestant headache. We have the Catholic headache. <laughs> so, Catholic headache. Perhaps that's why, <laughs> of course, it, it's a joke, but perhaps that's why in France, they are not interested in philanthropy. Uh, it's certainly, they, they don't believe in God. They don't believe they're going to the sky anyway. They, they, don't, they don't think they can marry their way. They buy the ticket to the paradise. So they, they don't believe that. I'm not sure Americans believe that, but certainly the French don't. Unfortunately. But, but you, you are right. Uh, I mean, the question of values, of course, is the values of the of the elite, of the upper class. This is very important because they have so much power. Um, I'm very pessimistic about that. Um, perhaps I'm a bit more optimistic about the, the, the women in that milieu, which are, I think, to be more, more human, perhaps. But, but I think magic is as, as a better approach. It's when he's talking about hegemony, and he says, uh, these, these people have a lot of power, but they are not hegemony in terms of value. The middle class has, has, the middle class has a, a lot of influence on the public discourse and um, the sort of journalistic characters, you name it. 
Um, and so the art is stable. You know, the, the artists are always on the side of the uh, of the big movement for. Uh, I mean, in Ethiopia, for instance, the movement of artists. So, so there is, there is a. You get the There is a. It's, it's not one way. It's not. It's a block. I would. I would. I would invest more in trying to understand how the middle class, uh, which is a bit confusing in said, but uh, which is a lot of two words, let's say, the middle class, and how they can sort of uh, check the cynicism, I would say, of most of the elite, including my view of American elite. You know, what Warren Buffett said, Warren Buffett, the famous investor, he said, uh, he said, class struggle. <laughs> yeah, of course there is class struggle, and, and we are winning it. We are winning it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, the first, the first was more a series of, of uh, very interesting, for, interesting for me information about the Polish, uh, uh, Polish system of timing, uh, flat tax system. I didn't know you had a flat tax system. That's uh, it's, it's more complicated. Uh, perhaps, but but. I would be interesting to know more uh, later on because you know I, I know that some people propose a flat tax system and uh, how it works. Does it, according to our colleagues, it work that way. Uh, and, and so the last question is about how the precari people in precarity could organize. Uh, was it your question? Yeah. Um, I've been working a lot in the last years about the precarity, what it means exactly, and. Uh, House out of uh, this is region of Robert Castel, which is very important uh, scholar in France. Uh, he died. He was a close friend of Bourdieu, of myself. He wrote a famous book called *Les Métamorphoses de la Question Sociale*, uh, and uh, I think it's translated into Hungarian. <laughs> no, really. Uh, For sure, it is. But in English, it is, it is in English. Uh, but it was first translated into Hungarian and, and, and in Spanish. And uh, well, he makes a point that uh, I was talking about France actually, uh, but that uh, there is a guillotage, there is a slow process of uh, of of the weakening the regulation, the, the rights, the social rights of employees of salaried people. That's that's what he called precariousness. You know, it's, it's not a, so much a question of. Uh, Wages, it's a level of wages. It's a question of uh, of uh, destabilizing the the protections, the the, 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 the regulation. Uh, we have a lot of regulation. In fact, you can't fire somebody like this. It's complicated to fire somebody. Uh, and then, uh, then also, he's talking about the precarization of, of households, of families. You know, but, uh, uh, so indeed, we have a lot of uh, single women now. It is a one of the biggest problems. So how, how these people can uh, organize, uh, frankly, I, I don't know, because uh, the long history of uh, the union, unionization, uh, that uh, skilled workers organize much more easily than unskilled workers. And, and people have a good pay organize better than people who are uh, just uh, trying to make ends meet. That, that's a paradox. Uh, that's a paradox we have in France right now. We are, we are in a crisis, so the government changed from right to left because people will change anyway. You know, uh, they, they want to change it. They want to try everything. Next time they might try even the Front National, the extreme left, because they want they want to have they want to have somebody push uh, the economy. And they don't know where to look for this person. But, uh, but the the problem is that the We don't see. We don't see. Uh, it's it's a vote on the left. It's not an organization. It's not a mobilization on the left. Although the French are very uh, easy to mobilize. I mean, easier to mobilize than, than in other population. But uh, it's uh, it's quite difficult because also because of this discourse of saying, well, people who, who defend their rights are conservative. The working class is conservative now, and the people who are uh, on, on the move. Are the entrepreneur. It's a kind of complete uh, change of, uh, let's say, 40 years ago. Well, yeah, the bourgeoisie was conservative, the working class was progressive. Now it's, it's a change. So, and intellectuals haven't been up to the, to the 
to the task of reconstructing some uh, progressive society with too much repeating uh, old stuff. So I, I, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to your question. But in a way, we see that when when the French economy works well, like in the 60s under the war, then people uh, are more confident of themselves. They confident in the future, so they are ready to mobilize and ready to to go into the street to try to change something. And you got May 68, for instance, it was a fantastic uh, social movement. I participated. It was a, something incredible. It was a 10 million people on strike, which was half of the active population for 10 days. But when when you have got the, an economic crisis, people just they simply they, they 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 go traveling, but they try to fight for themselves. You know, the less solidarity. This is a paradox. So maybe we will uh, ask uh, last question. Uh, yeah. As uh, as it is quarter to eight. Uh, last question, and we will leave some question, uh, questions for tomorrow. One, one small uh, last question uh, related to what you said in the beginning of the uh, lecture about Nordic countries. You said that Nordic countries are like labor market with some elements of worker. So many elements. The Nordic countries are more le uh, free market with some elements of welfare. Yeah. Uh, could you please elaborate more? I think that in the context of the discussion about the capitalism could be uh, quite interesting to develop uh, this issue and maybe you have also some, um, some, something you could share from your research. Yeah. Would be also interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. In, um, the, between uh, 99 and uh, 2002 and 2003, I got a big project from the European Union and I had a, a bit of precarity. Um, I had uh, seven, uh, six teams in, in six countries, and one was in Sweden, it was headed by a daily guy teaching in Sweden, um, Thomas Boyer. And, uh, and there was also Ireland, there was Portugal, there was Britain, France, of course, uh, Italy, and that's it, and Finland. And um, so we're comparing the situation of the poor, um, various categories of the poor, like, uh, like long uh, single mothers, uh, uh, unemployed workers, uh, immigrant families, in these uh, seven countries. And uh, the result was uh, very clear. Uh, a single mother, for instance, had better be in Sweden or in France, because in France it was the generous, than in Portugal or in Ireland. It was a catastrophe uh, to be in uh, Portugal or in Ireland. Um, Sweden actually uh, appeared as a, almost a paradise of uh, good organization and uh, welfare support. Um, and in other countries, we got we were collecting life stories and family case stories. So we got quite a lot into the subjectivity of of the of the people. And I think the conclusion we I was drawing, I think, was my colleagues accepted this conclusion, is that contrary to the uh, what is often repeated, you know. If you have too much people, you have too much welfare, you get, you get people passive and lazy. And they, they fall into the so-called poverty trap. And the poverty trap is that, yeah, they, they, they are poor, but they have enough to survive, so they are not going to move. So you should cut social help so that they, you know, they try to react and go to the market and sell their labor power and uh, contribute to the economy. That, that's a way to deal with poverty. Well, that doesn't work. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. We have seen uh, in England it is like this, in Ireland it was like this, in uh, northern Italy it was like this, in Portugal there was not the ideology but it was a practice because there was nothing for the poor so they had to 
indeed to find a job, uh, and, uh, and they were very bitter. When you are young, you say, I'm going to take care of myself, myself, I'm going to do it. But then when you, when you get very bad jobs, uh, lousy jobs, when you get uh, fired time and again, uh, and you cannot accumulate, you cannot accumulate skill, you become, uh, you take jobs which makes you uh, ill because it's uh, the jobs nobody else wants to take. Then when you reach 30, 35, you are sort of worn out and you are bitter, you, you, are, uh, you, have, you lose hope. At some point you stop struggling. Now, uh, in Sweden, we met people who were uh, having unemployed, especially just foreigners who came here, you know, just uh, they, 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 were, they were political uh, refugees and they, they, they didn't speak Sweden, but they were helped. And if you help people, if you encourage them, if you tell them, we shall help you provided you help, you help you yourself. You know, don't be passive. In Sweden, the social workers are not like in France. They, they pester you if you, you have to show up at the, at the office, at the whatever office, an employment office, say every morning. If you don't show up, they will call your neighbors. You say, well, what are you doing? Is he still in bed or whatever? What's happening? They, they, they pester you. But I mean, it's okay. It's okay because it's, they give you money, but they don't give you money for nothing. They, they, so, so they push you, at the same time, they are positive, they encourage you. And so the, the conclusion was radically opposite to the common sense of any 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 liberal economist, which means British, American, French, all together who say don't give too much to the people, makes them lazy and passive. It's a contrary. If you, if you support them uh, but, and you, you, you give them the, the nerve, because to work hard to teach, to, to educate themselves, how to learn a skill, because they know that in the end the efforts will be rewarded. Whereas in your, in you are in a tough society like say Portugal, poor and tough, uh, then then they they get broken by the system after a few years. Yeah, that that's that's uh, that what we found. But uh, we found something else in this uh, project. What was the question already? Um, what was the question uh, about Sweden? Yeah, the, another another thing I want to say. Uh, Sweden's well, you must know that the, the four countries are quite different. So they, uh, in Sweden, you have big companies, very big companies. There is a, a family, I forgot the name, who owns you know, half of the Swedish economy. Um, perhaps not half, but a lot. Uh, okay. In Denmark, you have only small, middle level companies. Uh, they produce a lot of bacon. For instance, all the bacon for the day is produced in Denmark. And so, it, you know, these small companies, they need to be able to fire people if, if, they lose, if they lose a contract. So in Denmark, they have a system where you can be fired easily, but then you get 90% 90% of your salary for, let's say, at least a year. So it's okay. It's, it's, it's no drama to get fired. Um, Sweden is, is a different system. Finland is still a different system. Uh, Finland, as you know, is, is on top on a visa uh, education study. Uh, and always still a different thing because they have a lot of oil, so they are rich, but they, they, they save the money. So there are four different, uh, four different uh, systems. But the Swedish, everybody told about the Swedish welfare system, it was the first, but it was, it was actually negotiated with the other countries. They, 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 they did that very intelligently. Of course, the Swedes did it because uh, they have not been always uh, People say they are protested, they are, they, are, they are equalitarian. That's not true. If you look, if you look at the Swedish movie of uh, Ingmar Bergman, for instance, uh, showing the Swedish class relation in the 20s, this is very tough. But what happened was uh, a mobilization of the working class in Sweden in 1931. And after a while, the labor government came and they sort of designed all this uh, intelligence system. Now, the paradox, if you take it, uh, if you have a the Davos Forum, in the Davos Forum they, they pass out questionnaires, they ask entrepreneurs uh, in which countries is, is good to invest. And Sweden and Finland always come on top. Some of them come on, France comes quite low. But uh, in Sweden, Sweden is entrepreneur friendly. And so, so is uh, Denmark, Norway. Uh, so they have a good work state, but at the same time, they are uh, friendly towards free enterprise. So it's a, it's a mystery to me. I cannot uh, tell you why, but that the, 
it seems there is no, uh, what's called it? It's possible to combine the two things if you if you do that uh, intelligently. So for me, ever since I've done this uh, this research project, uh, I I have the belief that this model, which is a bit on the on the on, on the way back, now this is a, is not as good as before, but it's still there. Is very uh, very defended by the public opinion. They, they don't want to let it go. So this is probably the best in the world. Except with the exception of Japan, perhaps the Japan is a very different society, very sort of very tightly connected. Now it's a, it's really the best uh, so far, the so-called Swedish model, which is in fact you know these uh, the, these four uh, countries. So I've heard a lot of uh, arguments against uh, against that, saying for instance, oh, but there are small countries, so so you can have that in a small country or five million inhabitants. You cannot have that in a big country as Germany. This is I don't see the I don't see the rationale of this argument. Um, so yeah, uh, I invite everybody to learn more about these uh, these uh, models. If you go on, the, on Google, you get only uh, papers by American scholars who try to show you that this is bad. Uh, bad models. It's, it's a you have to look a bit harder. Uh, the Swedes and, and the intellectuals in this country have a particularity. They don't want to boast their system. They don't want to sell it to the world. They want to keep it for themselves. I've been in a, a discussion with them. So why don't you why don't you make propaganda for that? And I say, well, it's, it, we're happy with it. We don't want to we don't want to interfere. Everybody has his own. So people will say uh, it's a question of culture. Uh, and this this is the point I want I want to say. Then I stop. There is a, a, I have a colleague, Apostolis Papakostas, as you know the name, he's a Greek, he's a Greek name, but he lives in Sweden. He has been there a student of sociology and he stayed, he's now a professor in uh, Södertom College uh, near Stockholm. He made a very interesting comparison between what's happening in Sweden and in Greece. But years ago, two years ago, it was before Greece uh, collapsed. Uh, and what was he saying? Uh, he was saying, Okay, in Sweden everything is smooth, and people say this is a culture, this is protestant ethics. In Greece, uh, well, we have corruption, we have uh, <clears throat> bad politics and all this, and that's because of Greek as what they are. Culture, the cultural explanation, which of course Bourdieu kept repeating, the cultural explanation is really the very last, if you have tried all, all kinds of other explanations you have failed, then you go to cultural explanation, otherwise, don't. Because everybody jumps on the virtualized me. No, 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 no. Okay, uh, then uh, Apa, uh, Papa Costas makes a history, you know, the history of Greece and uh, Sweden, and the construction of the states, the building of the state. In Sweden, was built by the army. But Sweden was had a sort of a, had a conquest all over, you know, Finland uh, and also Posta, I think at some point. So the, the army was important. So the army is the bureaucracy, so they, it's honest normally. It's, uh, so they, they, build, they build the state in this way, hierarchical, honest, correct, you know, whatever. Now, in, in Greece, Greece, as you know, was uh, occupied by uh, the Ottoman Empire for, for a long time, centuries. Then the Ottoman Empire uh, withdrew, and then the Greece was left as a, as a village. You know, no, there was no political structure at all. And so the political structure the state was built from below by local politicians who promised promised everything to the local uh, villagers, electors. If you vote for me, I will I will uh, I will make the road and all this and all that. And so the, the state was built from below through this kind of political bargain. And, and, uh, so don't you understand why the Greek state has been always kind of corrupt, if you want. Corrupt is a strong word. Uh, but uh, it's uh, the idea of the collective interest is totally absent from the Greek politician. Whereas in Sweden, the collective interest means something. And like we say, say for instance, the sense of the state, sense of the, state, sense of the collective, uh, very important. So now you understand, it's not a question of culture, it's a question of history, you see? I think mm -hmm. this is very interesting. Uh, thank you uh, for, uh, for your...
answers and for the for interesting lecture. And uh, I would like to zaprosić Państwa na jutro na konferencję zaczynamy o godzinie 10. Wykładem profesor Delukła o kreatywnym rodzicielstwie w rodzinach muzułmańskich. I później kolejne, kolejne wykłady będą się w pewnej mierze odnosić do, do tego, o czym dzisiaj mówiliśmy. Na przykład będzie mój wykład, który zaplanować, będzie właśnie o, o, o sytuacji osób pracujących fizycznie w warunkach elastycznych, prekaryjnych. Więc będę chciał pokazać, jaka jest moja wizja samoorganizacji tych, tych ludzi. Ale myślę, że wiele tych wątków, które dzisiaj poruszyliśmy, powróci, które będzie też okazać, by o nich ponownie podyskutować. Dziękuję Państwu i serdecznie zapraszam.